And he was talking about courage and about putting the message out there as it is and putting it out in a very skillful way and diplomatic way is a great art. And our next speaker is a qualified architect, a qualified barrister, homeschools her five children, columnist for the Irish Catholic, spokesperson for the Iona Institute, and a lady who wasn't afraid to put her head up when it needed to be up in the time of the pro-life debate and discussion. And she went in there and matched it with the best of them. And really, I admire her courage, her tenacity, and her intelligence, her diplomacy. Please put your hands together for Maria Steen. Deliver us, we beg thee, O Lord, from every evil, past, present, and to come. And by the intercession of the blessed and glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and of the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, and of Andrew, and of all the saints, mercifully grant peace in our days, that through the assistance of thy mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all disturbance. I wanted to begin this talk with a prayer and these words of the Libera Nos prayer said by the priest directly after the Our Father at Mass seemed appropriate. I know Father Collins mentioned them last night as well. For the theme of this year's conference is, as you know by now, deliver us from evil. I've used the translation from the Latin rite, which is subtly different from the one that we're used to, in requesting deliverance from evil of past, present, and future, in calling on the intercession of Our Lady, who is so powerful against the devil and of the saints, and in beseeching God to keep us safe from disturbance rather than distress. We Irish Catholics have had our fair share of distress in recent years. Evil has not slept. We've seen the laws of our country changed to reflect a mindset that allows the strong to take advantage of the weak. We've seen our culture altered so that it is now more socially acceptable to have an abortion than to put your child up for adoption. We've seen that which is sacred mocked and ridiculed. We've seen marriage losing all sense of purpose or value. A tax system that penalizes married couples who want to care for their own children has contributed to an ever-increasing housing problem. The family is under sustained attack, politically and culturally. And we have seen those at either end of the spectrum of life, the young and the old, increasingly perceived as burdens and treated accordingly. And it's a long way from being over. The education of our children is being assailed. Schools have become a battleground, a prize for those who have promoted the changes to which I've referred, who remain unsatisfied with their achievements to date. And instead, it's a mechanism for the distribution of propaganda and the inculcation of young minds of a secular materialism that denies the existence of any metaphysical or moral reality and holds all religion, but in particular the Catholic religion, in contempt. The materialistic vision of life that underpins these efforts inevitably reduces human relationships to the transactional, in which we value other people for what we can get out of them. It rejects transcendent good, just as it tra rejects transcendent evil. And that is all the opening that evil needs. So the question is, how do we, as Catholics, as followers of Christ, live in a society in which evil is allowed to flourish? How do we resist becoming one with that culture? 
How do we live in the world but not be of the world? How are we to be delivered? The answer, of course, is always God. It's only God that can deliver us from evil. Deliverance entails more than the mere absence of evil. It's more even than just freedom. It connotes freeing us from the power of evil and bringing us to a place of safety and rest. And this is what the Good Shepherd always does for his sheep. It's what God wants for us and what he offers us. It sounds straightforward, right? But here's the thing. He's involved us in the decision-making process. He's given us free will. We can reject his offer. While we cannot deliver ourselves, only God can truly deliver us from evil. We must actively want to be delivered. God is the divine physician who can cure and heal and deliver us. Yet we must make our own efforts too. We must go to him. Just like the prodigal son, what is required is that we start the journey back to the father. My favorite line in that parable is, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity. He ran to the boy, clasped him in his arms and kissed him. While he was still a long way off. God will meet us and help us home, will deliver us, but we must resolve first to turn towards him to begin that journey home. And I want to consider the idea of turning towards God and its importance for our deliverance. I suggest that when we turn towards God, we have to do so with integrity. And by that I mean acting in an int integrated way, which requires the use of all our faculties. I want to propose to you that in the face of the evil that confronts us, we must redirect our minds and in particular our intellects towards God. As creatures brought into being by God, we are a union of body, mind, heart and soul. Turning towards God means turning our whole selves towards him. If any one element or facet of our nature is not engaged in this effort, we will fail. It's no good loving God and rejecting evil in your heart and soul if you do not also do so in your body and in your mind. The Bible tells us that faith without works is dead, but faith without reason, mindless faith, is a contradiction in terms. What's demanded of a Catholic, of any follower of Christ, is a holistic understanding of our nature as human beings. This is the prerequisite to acting with integrity. Integrity is the state of being whole and undivided. We act with integrity when our entire person, body, mind, heart, and soul is directed towards the good, the beautiful, and the true. This is what God demands. As Jesus himself confirmed, the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, with integrity. In seeking to live out this commandment, in our, our attempts to live an integrated life, we have an adversary. We as Catholics have to recognize and acknowledge that evil is a metaphysical and a spiritual reality. It's not merely the absence of something else. It has will and direction. It has personhood. St. Peter calls the devil the adversary who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And while the devil may sometimes be as fierce and threatening as a wild beast, he's more often subtle and scheming. Our earliest parents were undone not by the lion's jaws, but by the serpent's tongue. The integrated person who is directed in all aspects of his being towards God is a difficult proposition for the adversary. 
Because what evil seeks is a vulnerability, a fracture. Just as the devil has delighted in and exploited our culture's stubborn refusal to acknowledge his existence, so too he seeks out any gap or flaw in our integrity and works to expand it. As Christ himself told us, no house divided against itself will stand. My experience in recent years, and particularly in relation to the abortion referendum, has convinced me of the imperative need to ensure that our reason and intelligence are directed towards God. Now, faithful Catholics are sometimes inclined to say, surely the important thing is to have a loving heart. Is that not sufficient? Well, to answer this question, we need to return to the very beginning of human existence and ask another, why did God make us? Well, the Catechism tells us that God made us to know, love, and serve him in this world and be happy with him in the next. And the order in that sequence is very important. We cannot love God without knowing him first. And when we love him, we want to serve him. But knowing comes first. And knowing means engaging one's mind and one's intellect. Faith requires love, and we do not love, cannot love one whom we do not know. Christianity is, above all, an encounter with Christ, the forging of a personal relationship with Christ, and we do this through prayer. But we cannot pray at all without directing our minds towards God. We cannot know or understand his laws or obey his commands without engaging our intellect in the effort. And if we do not engage our minds to get to know him in prayer, nor direct our reason to follow his laws, then we're leaving ourselves wide open to the influence of the opposite, evil. Not engaging our intellect and directing it towards God leads a person directly to evil. In our society, for the last number of decades, we have seen the elevation of emotions and feelings over reason and faith. The tactic is clever. Disengage your intellect and reason, consider only how you feel. The result is what's sometimes called emotivism. We only need to look at the abortion referendum to see how the theory of emotivism was put into practice. The national broadcaster, RTE, as well as many other broadcasters, took a deliberate decision to focus on per personal stories for the purposes of the debate, such as it was. They did the same for the marriage referendum, and mark my words, the same thing will be done in any debate on education and on euthanasia. The approach is not explicitly anti-intellectual. Those who describe themselves as modern, liberal, free from religion, always claim to be on the side of science after all. But it is anti-intellectual. It is one of the baser forms of populism in which the demagogue seeks to arouse strong feelings in the population. And very often these feelings stem from an inclination that all things being equal could be good. So in the abortion debate, the yes side attempted to excite feelings of compassion for the plight of women in very tragic and difficult circumstances. Such feelings are not wrong. Catholics should feel compassion. The problem is when the feeling is the end of the argument so that the conclusion becomes foregone. The problem is when what is a Christian virtue, compassion, is elevated above all other virtues. The approach of the Catholic confronted with the case of a woman carrying a baby suffering from a serious illness, for instance, must be one of compassion and sympathy. But that doesn't answer the question of whether it's morally right to kill that baby. The strategy of the pro-abortion lobby was to assert that even asking that question meant that we had no compassion. This emotivist approach was founded on years, even decades, of relentless propaganda, the arousal of feelings unchecked by reason. A traditional debate in which there is a real discussion 
between two or more sides, where the principle of audi alterum partum, to hear the other side, is respected, is a dangerous thing because it makes people think. And that was the last thing that was wanted in the referendum, for people to think. For them to think about babies, for them to think about the fact that an innocent human life, many, many innocent lives, hung in the balance. For them to think about the fact that they were to use their right to vote, to vote the rights of others away. The subsequent referenda on blasphemy and divorce passed with barely a whisper of opposition, and this is in a country where a majority still professes to be Catholic. In Ireland, we have left our minds vulnerable, weak, and the devil takes advantage of that. As in much of the Western world, we have fed our minds on a diet of junk. Our education system has for many years exhibited a strong anti-intellectual streak, where students are encouraged to regurgitate stock answers without really having to think things through for themselves. Many secondary schools have become fostering grounds for activism of different hues, where there is less emphasis on the development and education of the intellect or academics, and more emphasis on what particular political or cultural movement a student identifies with. This is social engineering, pure and simple. Then we have the junk food that we consume every day in the form of print, broadcast, and social media. These dull our minds as well as our senses. We become immune to their effects on us. The chief one being that we stop questioning the message that is being communicated to us. We outsource our responsibility to exercise proper judgment to organizations that generally hold us and all we hold dear in contempt. And when we're met then with an argument or a proposition, one that a well-trained mind would be able to question and grapple with and expose as being flawed or unjust, we're found wanting, unable to come up with an answer, unable to provide a rebuttal. And though we're often troubled by some remaining visceral instinct that it's wrong, we've left ourselves so weak that we are vulnerable to the persuasiveness of the majority. We have no defenses. Father Vincent Toomey describes this visceral sense of right and wrong as the prime ordeal echo of truth in the deepest recesses of people's hearts, thanks to the fact that man is created in the image and likeness of God. But, he says, that voice of God in our hearts is often silenced by the more strident voices that resound through the culture we imbibe and the society in which we live, as well as by our own refusal to be attentive to the small, still voice of God. This is a great challenge for our society and the church, as well for, as for us as Catholics. When we fail to engage our intellect, when we fail to employ our reason or subjugate it and twist it to serve the, uh, our appetites and desires, when we let our emotions predominate, we lose balance, we lose equilibrium, we lose peace, the very thing that we pray for in the Liberanos prayer. Mercifully grant peace in our days and through the assistance of thy mercy, we may always be free from sin and safe from all disturbance. The opposite of peace is disturbance. Disturbance is a lack of serenity, of calm, and it comes about when all things are not directed towards God. We cannot hear the voice of God without calm, without peace. The remedy then is an integrated approach that brings balance and peace, that gives due place to the mind, to the intellect. Due place, I don't say that the intellect is supreme or that it should be elevated above all other aspects of our personhood, that too is incompatible with true integrity as it diminishes and undervalues the significance of the heart and the soul. 
It's a question of giving the intellect its proper place. The mind needs to govern the will, which in turn governs our appetites. But in the end, the mind, even reason itself, is a servant, the servant of faith, a place for everything and everything in its place, to use an old adage. When we fail to employ our reason, we undermine the foundations of our faith. We undermine conscience. Just like the seed sown on rocky ground, we may hear the word and immediately receive it with joy, but without the roots provided by a sound intellectual grounding, faith may only endure for a little while. When tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, it falls away. How well this describes the faith in Ireland. Without a rooted faith, we make ourselves vulnerable to structural defects. The integrity of our nature is sundered. Our relationship with God is fractured. So to provide roots for faith, we have to prepare the ground. All too many of us left our religious education behind us with our school days. It's part of our duty as Catholics to continue to educate ourselves in the faith and our children. We must read, we must nourish our minds. When we do this, we pluck out the rocks and weeds from the soil and cast them aside. We till the earth and make it ready to bear fruit in plenty when the seed in the form of the word of God is planted in it. Work is required. The field doesn't plow itself. However, if we will put that work in, we will be rewarded. And while emotivism is one of the scourges of modern discourse, there's another tactic often resorted to by those who seek to discredit anyone espousing a Catholic viewpoint. It's to condemn us as irrational. Our views, they say, are founded only on faith. They're not susceptible to reasonable and rational discourse. They're based on credulous superstition, we're told. They say, listen instead to us, we're the experts. Our views are based on rationality and science. We can be trusted. Well, living as we do in an era of tremendous achievements of science around us, that provide us with comfort and luxury to an unprecedented extent, it's tempting to give in and believe that science really does have all the answers. The temptation is even stronger if we doubt our premises, if we suspect that our opponents just might be right, that there might be no reasonable or rational basis for our beliefs. But we have to resist this idea. Our faith has been shared by generation after generation, among whom are numbered the intellectual giants. St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, who died before he was 50, was known as the angelic doctor for his compelling defense of the rationality of faith. Gregor Johann Mendel, the father of genetics, was an Augustinian friar. The Big Bang Theory was first proposed by Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian priest. And there are many, many others. These men were not fools. When we consider the remarkable intellectual tradition of the church, when we read the words of wisdom of our ancestors, when we continue to educate ourselves and our children in the fullness of our religion, we find a renewed confidence in our faith. If you can understand, however imperfectly, that our faith is both reasonable and rational, then we will be better able to withstand the assaults of a faux rational culture and be more at peace. Our minds will be more fully integrated with our faith, which is just as it should be. Integrity has been described as the acquisition of what St. Ambrose called the cardinal virtues, namely prudence, justice, courage, and self-control. These apply to the mind, as well as to the body and the heart. 
If we can acquire these virtues and discipline our minds as well as our hearts and bodies, we begin to mature spiritually. That's when we become whole and undivided. We can't be wise, we can't enjoy that gift of the Holy Spirit without calm, without equilibrium. And that means living in an integrated manner, directed towards God. You may have noticed, I know I have, that those who are really holy, those who seem closest to God, almost always appear to be at peace and have attained a state that we might call serenity. I think of some of the poor Clare sisters who are just around the corner, whose faces shine with peace and tranquility. I think I, of some of the mothers I know of small children who, despite seeming to be surrounded by chaos, maintain their calm and serenity. I think of priests and the many good men out there who go about their work in peace and imperturbability. Serenity allows for reflection and the development of wisdom. Peace and calm bring clarity, the ability to see things as they truly are, and the true perception of reality is the beginning of wisdom. None of this is a matter of intelligence. No one should believe that he or she lacks the intellectual equipment to undertask, undertake the task of directing his or her mind towards God. Our paltry efforts at understanding the majesty, the splendor, the love of our creator serves only to highlight our limitations. Compared to God, the intellectual power of the greatest doctor of the church is less than a tiny child. Yet even tiny children can direct their minds, limited as they are, towards God. And so must we. Although God has blessed the church with some of the greatest minds in history, more commonly, he uses the meek, the lowly, the uneducated to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom. He has given understanding and enlightenment to mere children while great men are left in the dark. God's ways are not our ways. God is our heavenly father. Like the father of the prodigal son, he sees us from a long way off. He knows when we are turning our minds towards him. Let us do it. And in turning to God, guard what you expose your mind to and what you allow your children to expose their minds to. Be careful of what you consume, what imagery, words, and thoughts you let into your mind through the senses. Stay awake. So many of us wander, sleepwalk into watching, listening, or practicing that which is evil because it has become normalized in our culture. In the same way that we can become holy by forming good habits in the choices we make in the little things we do, we can invite evil in through the little things by bad choices that we make. Be on your guard, but be not afraid. God is waiting. Help him by coming to know him better. We need to spend time with him. We need to pray. We need to encourage each other and help each other to do the same. We need to be active in service of him by helping in a concrete way those who are in difficulty, particularly mothers and babies. Don't be afraid to take a stance in opposition to the culture in which we live. We need to stand up and be counted. And there are many opportunities to do this, whether in conversation with family and friends, or in the ballot box, or by joining thousands of others in the Rally for Life on the 4th of July in Dublin. But read also. Turn off the television and radio, and if you must, listen to a podcast that will educate you and encourage you. But I warn you, be careful. There are many false prophets who will speak about all things Catholic or political issues which seem to be linked, but they will drag you into a very negative space. This is not life-giving. And true faith in Christ is always life-giving. 
It helps our human nature to flourish, even in the midst of adversity. It brings us peace, stability, and balance, even when the whole world, including the church, seems to be at sea battling storms. Christ is our savior in those storms. If our faith should waver, like that of St. Peter, and we feel the cold pull of the waters closing around us, it is Christ who extends his hand to raise us up again. Keep your focus on him, mind, heart, body, and soul. He is here to deliver us. He has already delivered us. Thank you.